Um, and it's really lovely to be here with you all. Thank you so much. Fantastic audience. And um, I want to say a special thanks to Caroline for actually inviting me here today and for da Data and Society uh, to host me. I, it's a real honor to be here in such an important research institute, uh, which is looking at such, you know, crucially important issues um, at a time uh, where we are in a what I would consider to be an age of crisis when it comes to propaganda research and, and studies. So um, we need a lot more work on this topic. And um, today I'm going to be talking about SCL and Cambridge Analytica and a few of the, the insights that I've managed to gain during my uh, time studying propaganda. Um, Basically, um, the talk is called Peering Inside the Propaganda Machine. Now, that will give you a little bit of an idea of the kinds of research that I do. Um, but I'm going to... Um, okay. Um, so, a little bit just to introduce me and the kind of work that I do and how I got into peering into the propaganda machine, as I'm rhetorically putting it. Um, so my background uh, for my PhD research was looking into the war on terror and how propaganda was dis deployed by uh, the British and American governments um, uh, during uh, war on terror conflicts, particularly Afghanistan and Iraq. Um, during my research, I, um, I interviewed um, a, a large number, 87 um, different individuals who worked in those conflicts and who worked for the British and American governments, uh, right the way from the uh, White House out to people in um, uh, Afghanistan and Iraq, um, and the same in, in the UK and the, um, the British Ministry of Defense, 10 Downing Street and so on. But I also wanted to interview contractors and I looked substantially in the book also at, at contracting, not just SCL, but SCL were one of the groups that I was, I was looking at and, and the companies that I was looking at in this particular uh, area because they were doing an awful lot of defense work for the British and American governments and, and uh, many other um, uh, governments around the world. So I was, I've got very interested in this particular company um, and conducted a number of interviews which are in, in, in the book, uh, which came from my PhD research. Um, actually, my first book, though, was Bad News for Refugees. Where I did my PhD was Glasgow Media Group, and um, my, uh, my um, PhD supervisor, Greg Philo, um, uh, and I worked on this book together, which looked at uh, media coverage of asylum and uh, migration in the UK um, as that was developing into the great crisis that we've been experiencing in recent years, um, and looking at the really hostile coverage that uh, refugees got. Um, and the impacts that that had both on refugee communities and the country uh, co communities at large. Um, so we, we were looking at that and also about uh, at the, um, the ways in which uh, the journalists were reporting their strategies behind the scenes and so forth. Um, so this kind of background really led me to be very interested in, in all the topics that I'm, I'm going to talk to you about today. I should just mention, because um, uh, Caroline kindly um, introduced my book, that there is 50% off at the moment being offered by Manchester University Press if you use the uh, code Analytica. <laughs> so they're nice, nicely offering that just for today's um, talk, which is very kind of them. Um, so um, during the research on SCL, I discovered this company. And um, for the, the, the uh, Propaganda and Counterterrorism book, I also interview, interviewed Nigel Oakes here, who was the CEO of what's now known as SCL Group. It used to be SCL Limited. Um, SCL is a massive, SCL group, as you can see, is a massive network of different uh, companies. Um, and there was a lot of controversy over how these companies might or might not be related. Um, Cambridge Analytica is one of the companies within SCL group. Uh, so we're gonna come back to that a little bit. But um, just to say, this is somebody that I interviewed during my research on, uh, on defense and um, defense propaganda. And I, t I interviewed him and others at SCL in relation to that uh, and their propaganda work for governments. So um, during my 
uh, my research, I ended up kind of in these very strange circumstances of having, you know, um, quite actually a quite left-wing left approach. Um, this is me protesting Trump. <laughs> This is me um, at the um, in, inside the Pentagon. So I, I was kind of marrying this kind of very left-wing approach with like trying to also uh, navigate uh, networks that perhaps are you know um, uh, not so radical. <laughs> so um, I, I I sort of was uh, you know developing a methodology all the way through my research, through my uh, PhD and so on, that was really quite challenging. Um, but at the same time, uh, sort of um, navigating very difficult sort of um, communities that are very hard to access in ways that I was trying to elicit them to relax and talk and so forth and uh, develop uh, important relationships that would open up that, um, that important um, and very closed uh, type of uh, activities, uh, both by the government and also these contractors. Now, I I'm, I'm also put this up because I think it's really important to um, give the backdrop of how I got interested in Cambridge Analytica from this. Uh, when I, last year, during the um, election of uh, Donald Trump, I was actually writing a book called What's Wrong with the Democrats? Media Bias, Inequality, and the Rise of Donald Trump. So this started out just as a book on the Democrats and political communication, it still is. However, um, I realized during that election that part of the company that I had all these contacts in, um, you know, the, the SCL group, one of those companies was actually working for Trump. And I was like, well, there's a great opportunity. So I had to reach out to them and to try and develop these kinds of contacts and so on. Particularly when I realized, oh wow, they seem to have won here, you know? So, um, I mean, this, this really profoundly shaped my experience. Being over here all the way through the election was, it really impacted my research dramatically. It was, it was um, an incredible moment. I mean, this is the Women's March, but I was also here during the inauguration, and somebody actually did a Nazi salute at me during Trump's inauguration speech. I cannot even tell you, it brings goosebumps just now, how that affected you know, me on that particular day. Um, so I stepped back and I thought, well, what's going on here? This isn't normal. This does not feel normal. And um, I was very interested in how we got into this current um, divisive times, if you like. Um, so also, I had just, of course, gone through Brexit. And having a background in migration research, I was also very interested when I saw in the, you know, little emerging whispers and, and so on that, that there might have been a role played by Cambridge Analytica in that campaign. So this is me at that time. I was doing all this research on defense, but I, it somehow, all of a sudden, all of my, you know, contacts and networks seem to be related to all these other projects which I thought were completely unrelated when I first started them. So um, a little bit more about the book, uh, What's Wrong with the Democrats, to give you an idea. So what, I, what we are doing for that, uh, myself and uh, Professor Robert Entman, is we're analyzing media debates during the elections uh, from 2000 until 2000, actually 17, uh, using quantitative content analysis and QDA minor. Uh, software. We're doing audience research, a little bit surveys, um, and we've done, well, I've, I've done interviews as well on de the democratic campaigns with uh, different campaign officials and so on. We've got 18 interviews so far. I've also done a substantial section of that book looking at Cambridge Analytica and the Trump campaign and how, um, how Republican um, uh, communications has been transformed in recent years. Um, of course, there's also the backdrop of the elites and how elites have been jostling for power and realigning during this period. Uh, and um, of course, uh, without that, we would not have seen um, Steve Bannon in the, in the White House. We would not have seen, um, you know, this person who was vice president of Cambridge Analytica. You know, these are people who really put uh, Cambridge Analytica on the map. So, and, and of course, the funding, the money that they poured in to this company highly significant in shaping it, uh, what, we, what the outcomes were. Uh, a little bit of a uh, uh, 
something else I need to point to um, is the imbalance I think I see in, in, in communications in the US and in media. Uh, this is just, um, this is just uh, social media. However, I think it's really interesting study that's been done by um, Yoshai Benkler et al. at Harvard. I don't know if I'm pronouncing that right. I hope I am. Um, and you can basically see how there has this very large right-wing media nexus that is developed around this is Breitbart, uh, which, ha which you know, shot up in, in significance during this whole period. Then you have the mainstream around the middle, and there's really no comparable left-wing um, nexus, if you like. Um, the mainstream media um, are all this, these are the um, uh, it'd be blue because obviously they're um, uh, ones that are retweeted by liberals and, and um, Democrats, and this is uh, the Republican uh, retweeting and so on. So uh, I think that's a really important point is that there really doesn't seem to be a, a parallel. Um, some of our early data from the survey uh, we were looking at how, how people have reacted to Breitbart. Uh, this is a representative sample. I, haven't, I can't see the number. I think it's cut, cut it off. Uh, uh, but it is a rep representative sample of the US population. Um, and we were looking at uh, Democrats, Republicans, independents, and so forth, and all Americans. Um, how trustworthy is Breitbart? Now, of course, a lot of people are saying it's untrustworthy. However, I think the numbers that are saying it's trustworthy are decently worrying, um, especially considering like 20% of Democrats. I found that really a, a strange statistic, and we are still trying to figure that one out. This is work in progress, this book. Um, I'm going to be finishing over this summer. Um, but I think also important backdrop is about... Um, how um, inequality plays in this. Uh, because um, what, what we're talking about as well in the book is the, um, the growing gap between the rich and the poor and how that, of course, has been exploited in this particular election. Um, actually, um, small gov government policies run counter to most uh, public preferences in the US uh, for you know, how government should be run. Um, Hacker and Pearson argue that America has forgotten what made it great. Um, and actually, the free market dam damages economic interests and increases this um, inequality. Now, why is that important to today? Uh, my dis discussion today, well, I'd say that Democrats are failing to get this message across, and we're looking at how they might be able to get that over more effectively. Um, we're also, um, I, I also want to point to the fact that this has been exploited um, f in the campaigns. So we had, uh, of course, Crooked Hillary, which was a, a product of Cambridge Analytica's campaign. Um, so they were working on this particular narrative. And this is something that could be very easily exploited, is the, you know, the fact that Democrats haven't challenged these kinds of uh, policies and, and haven't really addressed people's the in growing inequalities in America. And um, there was an opportunistic moment uh, which was taken advantage of by Trump um, to, to essentially, you know, t to... Um, uh, you know, it, it, Democrats are made very vulnerable by their own uh, lack of, of an answer for this kind of problem. Um, and of course, also, it means that tensions within the country can be exploited by, you know, the right, by, by um, uh, politicians like Trump, but also um, by, f f perhaps also by, um, by Russia and so on. Um, in amplifying the divisions that exist. Now, um, one way, of course, that they, I, you know, we all are very familiar with this kind of uh, coverage that was seen uh, during and, and, and messaging that was seen during the uh, campaign, the build a wall, and so forth. Uh, highly targeted ads that produced um, and uh, and and directed at the. Um, uh, at um, swing states, in particular, um, and really exceptionally racist, uh, xenophobic and divisive rhetoric. There, has al there have always been dog whistles to racism in American politics, of course, um, but this really went to another level. And I think also the targeting of it um, was something that which 
arguably um, might be said to be, you know, the, the use of data to actually enhance the effect on the, get it to the right people at the right time, um, perhaps um, emphasize the impact that might have had. Um, and my evidence um, that I submitted, my, my uh, interviews that I conducted with uh, key executives at, at Cambridge Analytica, um, and, and also people that I discussed it with at uh, SCL, in particular the CEO, Nigel Oakes, uh, of, of SCL Group, um, really sort of helped to give um, a richer picture of uh, what was going on with um, shaping those narratives and with the thinking behind the strategy of the Trump campaign and of uh, Cambridge Analytica as well. So, um, and, and the ro wider role that that played in, within the election as a whole. So again, bringing this back to SCL Group, I'm gonna um, focus a little bit more on this diagram. So uh, we have Alexander Nix here. He's the person that a lot of you have seen in the, um, in the uh, big expose that, um, uh, that was on Channel 4, where he was uh, accused of uh, uh, entrapment and, uh, you know, of using prostitutes to, um, to, uh, to entrap uh, politicians in uh, campaigns. Um, so that is one figure that you might know, um, uh, and uh, Cambridge Analytica. Less people know about SCL, which is the wider group, and that embraces a lot of different companies that were wor working in uh, all sorts of different parts of the world. And also a uh, research um, center called, oh, there it is, Behavioral Dynamics Institute. So that's important because that it was set up by Nigel Oakes. And Nigel Oakes really believes that that is the sort of brains behind uh, the whole operation. And that is a research center which, um, which uh, has produced methodology, an underlying methodology, which is drawn on by all of the different companies. Now, when you're doing a campaign, you, you, you have to adapt your methodology for whatever place that you're working in. So that's not to say that, you know, the same, exactly the same things that they did in one place, they're going to do somewhere else. I mean, you have different media. Let's say you're working in, in Nigeria. The, the media there is obviously going to be very different to working in the United States or America. So you are going to obviously need to adapt these methods. Um, but the underlying methods and thinking and, and processes and, and research uh, into how people think and behave and how you understand and, uh, you know, understand behavior and personality and emotions and so forth, uh, it all draws on that kind of underlying social science research that they had done, uh, including working with, um, with, uh, with the military and with academics, with, with DARPA as well. So it's really important to, um, to note that the, the way that these things flow. Um, and that Nigel Oakes as well was, was kind of, certainly saw himself as the brains behind that. Um, right, so um, a lot of my evidence relates also to that relationship. Um, I submitted, uh, as Caroline said, to the um, UK Parliament's Digital Culture, Media and Sport Committee inquiry into fake news. And uh, a substantial body of evidence, so uh, long interviews. They didn't publish everything because a lot of it's going to be in my books as well as um, some of it was kind of sensitive and so on. I, I interview people about a lot of different things. And um, so... Um, the most important things that, that, that the um, inquiry wished to publish uh, came out. But they, just to say, they saw all of this in the context in which it was uh, recorded and so forth. Um, and you can, you can access the um, evidence here. Um, one of the important things I, I want to bring out is, is how um, Cambridge Analytica were, were working with the Trump campaign, um, which, which hinged on creating artificial enemies, using that, those, those nasty narratives that we saw on the previous slides, uh, and cynically utilizing um, Islamophobic content, um, which they knew to be false. So I want to show that, um, that people like Nigel Oakes, who was the CEO of, of SCL Group, knew this to be false. Thank <laughs> you. 
resonance with American audiences. Now you've picked up absolutely the right word there because when we explain in the two minute lift pitch mm. what happened with Trump, you can forget all the micro targeting and micro data and whatever and come back to some very, very simple things, which is Trump had the balls, I mean really the balls, yeah. to say what people wanted to hear. And we all thought it was a joke every time he said it. Yeah. Every time he said we're going to put up a wall for the Mexicans. And we're going, you can't say that. You know, it's not, yeah, it's loony. And then we're going to get the Mexicans to pay for it. And the Mexican yeah. president was going, I'm not bloody paying for any of this. But it yeah. didn't matter because in the Ross states, the, the guys were saying, look, I've got people, yeah. Mexicans coming across illegally, not paying any tax, yeah. taking all our healthcare, taking our jobs mm. and, and putting the price down mm. of things anyway yeah. and I'm bloody sick of it yeah. and so if a man comes up and says you know like, it, it's you know he didn't say we're going to redress the he said we're going to build a wall and keep these fuckers out yeah. and and to a lot of people that really had resonated. the balls to say what people wanted he to hear. He also said um, um, ridiculous things thing like, as well. uh, you know, we're going to ban Muslims from coming into the country yeah. because I'm sick of, of people taking machine guns and pointing them at schools and our children and our children are the most important thing. Well, there's never been a Muslim ever that's put, put a gun on an American school. But it seems to... But the perception yes. is there that they Yeah, that's terrorism the yeah. and it must be Muslims and yeah. there have been a lot of shootings. They're all Americans who do yeah. the shootings. And people go, yeah, fuck it, it's our children. Yeah. We don't want that. So, and, and you've got Hillary Clinton going, oh, we're going to increase the fiduciary financial spending and 4% so growth in our area. He's, he's admitting going, well, the, the you know, lack of threat. Yes. Um, and um, yet the content, of course, that was being, you know, um, uh, shared was, um, was very much uh, amplifying the sense of threat in relation to Muslims. Uh, okay. Um, okay. Mm. No, no. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> okay. Um, Oh, yeah, okay, and furthermore, okay, oh, I should play this one as well, sorry, <laughs> I'm not very good at this tech, uh, okay, um, furthermore, what else did he say? <laughs> okay, this is, this is one of my um, perhaps more shocking, uh, yeah, here we go. Because uh, exactly. also, you know, I mean, it didn't matter with with the rest of what he was saying. It didn't matter if he's alienating all of the liberal women, um, actually. And I think, you know, they, they was, he was never going to get them anyway. And you've got to think about That's well, right. what what would resonate, you yeah. know, with, with as many as as possible. Um, and often, as you rightly say, it's that the things that resonate sometimes to, to attack the other group and know that you're going to lose them yeah. is going to reinforce and resonate your group, which is why. Yeah. You know, Hitler, and I'm going to be very careful about saying so, must never pump to say this off the record, but of course Hitler okay. attacked the Jews yeah. because he didn't have a problem with the Jews at all. But the people didn't like the Jews, yeah. and so if the people saw, yeah, yeah, he could just use them to say, so he just leveraged an artificial enemy. Well, this is exactly what Trump did. He leveraged a Muslim. Okay. Yeah. I mean, you know, it's, yeah, yeah and that, it was a real enemy. ISIS is a, yeah. but how big a threat is ISIS really to America? Yeah. You know, really. Yeah. I mean, we're still talking about 9-11. Okay. 9-11 well, is a long time ago. Yeah. You... So, he knows full well how shallow this is. And I think, you know, the... The sh every, you know, perhaps it's not going to shock people that Trump might have lied once or twice. The, the New York Times has been reminding us repeatedly. However, I think one of the important things is to think about, well, what is the role of these kinds of companies and what they do. Uh, think about what they do. And also, um, Nigel Oakes in particular is going to come up again in my, uh, in my presentation. So uh, hold that thought. Um, so also there were questions over Brexit and some of my, um, my evidence relates to that. So I managed to um, also uh, 
get to interview some of the people who were very significant in the uh, uh, Leave.eu campaign. Um, and they also were talking about sort of artificial enemies of a kind. And I want to draw the parallels between the kinds of things that were being adopted in, in Trump's campaign and used by Cambridge Analytica and also this particular campaign. So for instance, um, Andy Wigmore, um, who was uh, the, the communications director of the Leave.eu campaign. Now, that's the, uh, the campaign uh, to, for, to leave the um, EU that, um, in the United Kingdom that um, was the quite, you know, xenophobic campaign uh, which uh, Nigel Farage was involved with, uh, which who some of you might have heard of. And here is a picture, Nigel Farage, Donald Trump, this is Andy Wigmore. This is the guy that I interviewed. I also interviewed Jerry Gunster on the left there, who was a US uh, Washington-based pollster who, who helped with the Leave EU campaign as well. Um, so you can see their respective roles there. Um, and what did Andy Wigmore say? He said, the only way we were going to make a noise was to follow the Trump doctrine. And I said, so you're com copying the Trump campaign completely, completely, completely. So you can't get more completely than that. Um, so he also said something quite interesting when you think about the parallels between what we just heard and this. You know, the propaganda machine of, of um, you know, the Nazis, for instance, mm -hmm. if you could take away all the hideous horror and all that kind of stuff, yeah. it was very clever, mm. the way they managed to do what they did. Of course. And, uh, you know, if you, if you, in its pure marketing central, yeah. you think, oh, okay. Yeah. You can see the logic of Absolutely. what they were saying, why they were saying, and how they presented it. You can see the logic of it. Like, and the you know, if you could take away all the hideous <laughs> horror, you know, because that like that's easy to do, of course. Well, Steps or whatever it is. Yeah. I think it says everything about the kind of people who are involved in these campaigns. <laughs> um, okay, and I did not bring up Nazis once in my questions, just to say that, and not with anyone. And they, they volunteered this themselves. Um, so, and I think that's an important point. Um, also, in my um, research on Brexit, so. During the interview, while I was interviewing Andy Wigmore, he gave me this. And I was looking at this, and I was like, right. So, so he was boasting to me about how much his insurance company, well, this is Aaron Banks' insurance company. This is Aaron Banks. He was the uh, UKIP donor who, um, who also uh, bankrolled Leave.eu, um, that campaign. And he, he led that campaign, founded that campaign. And... Um, he uh, owns Eldon Insurance, an insurance company in the UK. And he's, on, uh, he's a director too. And, oh, Eldon Insurance, that's interesting. Why is Eldon Insurance giving me something that, that has Brexit data in there? Like, look at that, Facebook videos and, and telling me the, the data on, on how much reach and how many views each of these videos has. And what is this? This is a profitability overview for Eldon Insurance. So um, this is something that uh, actually that um, uh, Brittany Kaiser talked a little bit about in her presentation, uh, her, her testimony, sorry, to the, to the British uh, fake news inquiry as well, because uh, she helped to develop, she said, she helped to develop a, a dual strategy. Uh, which uh, which talked about Eldon Insurance as well as uh, uh, as well as as Leave.eu and how these were kind of organised uh, to to draw on she said the same data. Now um, in my interview with Andy Wigmore, he talked about how they had used the same premises. They had used their actuaries from Eldon Insurance to work on the Leave.eu campaign. They'd used the same, you know, um, graphics people, the same marketers, the same, you know, it was all the same stuff. So, and then, of course, they made loads of money out of developing um, artificial intelligence um, methods for Eldon Insurance as well to profit lots out of this, as well as developing um, uh, artificial intelligence um, for Brexit. Um, so, 
I think this is a really important thing when we also look at the evidence that I was given by both him and Jerry Gunster in, in relation to Cambridge Analytica's role. Because um, Jerry Gunster told me, uh, oh, I was asking about psychographics and whether, whether they'd done those on, on leave.eu. And he said they didn't know. I mean, they provided some backbone for how to do it. Cambridge Analytica provided some backbone on how to do it. Then a lot of it was handed over to the campaign staff. And then, of course, when I was interviewing Andy Wigmore, he said, but what they did tell us they were going to do was probably, yes, probably was useful because we copied it. We didn't use them because we couldn't. Believe me, they're commercial. They would do nothing for nothing. They wouldn't do anything for nothing. It would have cost. Okay. So, so they didn't employ them, but they copied their strategy. And... So I think it's uh, one of the things I want to point to is the recent effort to ensure that the companies are seen as very, very separate. Because there is a worry about, you know, I mean, there are lots, lots of reasons why they have tried to make those, that web of, of network of different companies look as separate as possible. Um, and that is mostly um, motivated by pressure from democratic governments who are contracting the defense side of things, the government contracting side of things. Um, and also, there are other, other drivers. So survival of the bus business interest in defense and so on, uh, but also commercial and domestic politics, you know, not wanting the stuff in, in Africa to, to look too close to stuff in, in America, for instance, and uh, the, the kinds of campaigns that they might be doing. Uh, so um, also siloing is useful for pre pre preventing leaks, and not everybody who was a part of these companies thought the same way. So there were a lot of people who had joined the SCL defense contractor from a defense background, and they were not necessarily the type of people that you see, um, you know, uh, having that kind of um, uh, mindset of, of the uh, Cambridge Analytica um, uh, folks. So they, they don't have the same ideology necessarily. And uh, not everybody would want to be associated with some of the unethical activities that we've seen on the television recently. Um, so um, they want to prevent discontented stuff. So there were, there were cultural variations and they, they siloed things off. You, um, so, however, there seems to be a lot of evidence that um, there, there was... Um, uh, there were some parallels and there were certain um, overlaps and perhaps financial relationships that are of interest here. And um, the, uh, Nigel Oakes also sort of talked about what we were doing in that clip that I just played for, paid for when, when we deliver the two-minute lift pitch. We, and, and that's Cambridge Analytica he's talking about. Now, he apparently has nothing to do with Cambridge Analytica because he is the CEO of SCL. So... There are really important like nuances here that raise important questions that we have to address. So contracting authorities also, um, and even SCL employees, when I was speaking to them, sometimes got the name wrong. Uh, they were talking about the well, work for SCL when they actually worked for Cambridge Analytica, or that campaign was Cambridge Analytica. It becomes very confusing anyway. Um, so... Um, so one, one of the things that I think is extremely important is actually the role of governments in this. Because, um, uh, sorry. Okay, so he's gonna now talk about how, how they work, but they don't work together. It's, and it gets a little bit confusing. Um, I think it's really important, though. Um, and I, I want to show you on the slide as well. So he talks a little bit about how they've, um, how they've worked together and what his role is. Yeah. Worked and other people, we all yeah. But then internally in the company, that's a different thing. But the actual oh. corporate entities... Okay. Um, 
Uh, you know, I mean, Alexander will call me in. I'm going in this afternoon. Yeah. But in fact, you know, sure. uh, it's, it's our conversations apart, Trump apart. You know, we, we all work together. And, yeah. But, but you know, I would never, ever say what we do. We, we'd never sure. touch politics. Uh, I mean, I have in the past because we were, you know, I set up the company. But, right, yeah. but, but now I'm, I'm totally defense and I've got to be totally defense. Yeah. And I've got to be very, no, you know, because, you know, they. Can I ask? So, you know, he's saying, oh, I, I used to do the politics stuff, but now I'm, I'm totally defense. But I set up the company, he says. Now, what was his role in setting up that company? We've heard a lot about Bannon in setting up that company. What about his role? And how did he, you know, what, what's he been, you know, what are these meetings with, with uh, Alexander Nix all about? You know, we work, we all work together. We, we all work, you know, it's very, very f fishy, if you ask me. Um, also, he says, you know, because they, you know, um, and it's, it's uncomfortable, the sort of uh, differences that they have, you know, the reasons why they've set out these differences. Uh, I'm going to continue this because it's important to show uh, you about how, because I think the perception anyway is that um, the company's been sort of rebalanced towards politics by, yes, the, and maybe by, and over towards commercial, by the weight of the money. Yes, where it, the it has. Coming this, from. this is where Alexander Nix is, is, has been very clever. Okay. Um, and, and genuinely clever. I'm not, you know, it's, sure, not, sure. it's, it, it's he's turning into a very successful commercial entity. Yes. Um, whereas, and he would say exactly the same about me. He'd say, yeah, I'm too academic and too, you know. Yeah. And the, the analogy on a tiny, tiny, not an arrogant scale mm. is, is that, that if he's the Steve Jobs, yes. uh, I'm the Steve um, Wozniak, you know, I'm the sort of the. The, the guy who wants to get the, the engineering yeah. right, yeah. and he's the guy who wants to sell the flashy box. Sure, sure. And, and he's very good at it, and, okay. and I admire him enormously for doing yeah, it. Yeah, okay. um, but, but I'm the guy who says, like, yeah, but without this, you couldn't do yeah. any of that. So, he's saying that his responsibility for Cambridge Analytica, without him, they couldn't do any of that. That's what he's saying That If he's... If, if, if Alexander Nix is Steve Jobs, he's Steve Wozniak. Why haven't we seen him, you know, giving his testimony yet? That's what I want to know. I think it's deeply important. Um, you know, he, he claims that his kind of BDI methodology underpins a lot of this. You know, the, it's not just his BDI. A lot, a lot of people have worked in, in, in this particular research center. But he's, he's, he considered it, it his baby. I mean, this is something he's nurtured and really cares about a lot um, and sees himself as, as, you know, wanting to get the engineering right behind all of this stuff. Um, okay, so I think this is really important in relation to remembering what the kinds of things that they actually worked on, okay? Um, and uh, so in... Um, some of you might have heard a little bit about the, um, the Nigeria campaign. Um, and the person that I interviewed in relation to that was Sam Patton. Now, he's a, a Washington insider kind of strategist, uh, campaign strategist and, and uh, messaging guy. And he, um, he worked uh, also on Cambridge Analytica's efforts in Oregon, okay, in the Uni United States. Um, he was the... Um, uh, one of the strategists and uh, for for the Nigerian campaign, along with one other person, actually. Uh, but I want to play you um, something that uh, that came out in the inquiries. Oh, here we go. Uh, which I feel is really important for you to see. This was referred to as the mu murder video. Now, some of it's not very clear, but like so. Hopefully, it's not going to upset anyone. But if anybody does want to leave, it's uh, the, the content of the video itself is very disturbing because it includes uh, footage of real footage of uh, people um, uh, being burned alive and uh, dismembered and so forth. Um, okay, and this is just an introduction to what uh, the Guardian said about it. Uncertain. Sharia for all.
the, the videos um, included content where people were being dismembered, where people were having their throats cut um, and bled, bled to death in a ditch. Uh, they were being burned alive. There was uh, there's, uh, incredibly anti-Islamic uh, and threatening messages portraying Muslims as violent. What would Nigeria look like if Sharia were imposed as Buhari is committed to do? We can assume Buhari will punish all who speak against this regime. Ah, Buhari will strike a deal with Boko Haram, granting them women to be filled. Okay, you get the idea. Okay. I don't think we need to... Oh, yeah? Okay. <laughs> sure. Um, okay, I need to wrap up soon. Um, okay. Um, yeah, I'm pretty close to the, to the end anyway. Um, and... Uh, so I was going to play just another couple of clips from uh, this time for Sam Patton uh, talking about American politics. Um, oh, shall I shall I play this one? This one's quite good. <laughs> okay, uh, this this is uh, yeah. No, I'll, I'll talk about <laughs> this one. Okay, sorry. And I've worked in Ukraine uh, a lot. I've worked in deeply yeah. corrupt countries, yeah. and our system isn't very different. No. <laughs> I thought you'd like that. Okay, so I think that's, that's an important one. <laughs> I think that's important because it shows the attitude that they take, you know, the parallels in, that they see between different countries. Um, and to, to wrap it up, I'm very, very close to the end. Um, uh, to wrap it up, um, some, it, this raises so many questions. And, you know, I never expected my re work on this to sprawl into all these different areas. But people just started talking about their work in different campaigns in different places. And I realized just how big this was, you know. Um, so one of the points I want to make is regardless how you organize companies to perpetuate activities somewhat autonomously, um, an overarching group or network that includes different entities uh, responsible for assisting and amplifying corrupt politicians uh, who were responsible for spreading sort of violent or Islamophobic messaging, uh, spreading Islamophobic false discourses in the Western campaigns, uh, making money off Western governments to inter intervene in religious and ethnic conflicts as well as ta tackling uh, extremism and, and supposedly countering terrorism, um, all of those being done by different parts of this network. And we're supposed to not be worried about that. Um, you know, how related the companies are is a hugely important um, uh, point. And it doesn't matter that they've just collapsed, okay? The, you know, these companies grew out of a system that is, is still existing that we need to challenge and change. Um, and, you know, one of the issues is the State Department were pushing them to separate the companies. Uh, you can see that in my uh, clips that I just played for you. Why were they pushing them to separate the companies? Were they concerned about something? Um, you know, why were our intelligence agencies perhaps not you know, aware of this. Were they aware of this? I don't know. Uh, but we certainly have questions to ask about what was going on and the oversight of, of networks of companies needing to be taken into account, not just one company that you are contracting. Um, you know, because these are not unrelated events anyway, even if the companies might be argued to be unrelated. And I, I think it's really important as well that we have more academic work on the dark side of, of propaganda, you know, um, that, uh, you know, there's a lot of romantic sort of um, uh, studies of the surface stuff, of the soft power coming to save us all and, and helping, you know, uh, build harmony across the world. Um, and also focus, of course, on Russia, but like without thinking about, well, what the hell was all this? You know, what, 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 how is that destabilizing our world? Um, we, need, we need to not just be focusing on building better persuasion tools. We need to start thinking uh, more about the imbalances and abuses of power. Uh, that's my final thought, and I really appreciate your attention, and I'm looking forward to all the questions, and also to hearing from Tamsin and Caroline. Thank you very much, everyone. 
Thank you so much, Emma. And uh, we just have a few minutes left, but I do want to take some time for, um, we're gonna go to 510 if that's cool with everyone. Um, not at all, not at all. So um, thank you, Emma, for your presentation. And uh, we're just going to take a little moment for a response. Uh, our discussant today is Professor Tamsin Shaw, who is an Associate Professor of European and Mediterranean Studies and Philosophy at New York University. Um, and she's uh, written recently a really remarkable series of essays in the New York Review of Books on behavioral science, big data, and algorithmic analysis. So please join me in welcoming Professor Tamsin Shaw. Um, I know that Caroline has some really great questions prepared. So since we're short on time, I'm happy to just go straight into addressing those, what, what would you prefer? Sure, sure, so thank you. Um, so I, I just want to take the uh, prerogative of having you both here, this amazing level of expertise to be able to ask um, just some questions that I've had a really hard time answering. Um, so hopefully perhaps you can bring some clarity. Um, so Tamsin, you wrote recently in the New York Re Review of Books about dual use research, which has both defense and non-defense applications. And I learned for your, from your work, for example, that the National Cancer Institute emerged in the 1970s from a program examining bioweapons at Fort Detrick. This is really remarkable. Um, but you say, and I'm quoting you here, the development of behavioral technologies intended for military grade persuasion in cyber operations is rooted in a specific perspective on human beings beings, and is one that's at odds with the way they should be viewed in democratic societies. And that's the end of the quote. And Emma, I, I was thinking of that as I read the piece you wrote for Open Democracy UK, where you said the propaganda techniques that were researched and designed for, uses, for use as weapons in war zones be, became the basis of persuasion campaigns during democratic elections. And of course, that striking quote from Andy Wigmore considering propaganda in what he said was the pure marketing sense. So the question that I want to ask you is how have the folks that you've been studying drawn lines, if they've drawn them at all, between information weaponry on one hand and electioneering or even marketing on the other? And from your perspective, could those lines be redrawn in a way that would better preserve democratic principles? Um, well, I think there have been very few lines drawn because, as you say, we, we have this model of dual-use research in many areas now. The Silicon Valley economy has relied very, very heavily on that, on government support from the military and intelligence agencies like InQtel, the CIA's venture capital fund, and the venture capital funds that most of the defense and intelligence agencies have now. Um, and they have funded research that will both be useful for national security and have commercial application in order to boost the tech sector in general in America, which was lagging behind Japan, and now there's the fear that we're lagging behind China. Um, and I think that naturally creates the boundaries that it creates are very porous ones. The same kind of dual use has gone into a lot of the behavioral science research, which often originates in um, military and intelligence innovations. I guess Daniel Kahneman is the most famous behavioral scientist on Earth. And that, of course, originated in research done um, for the Israeli army and for the American military. And all of that does entail viewing people through a very a, a highly specific lens. Um, in Kahneman's case, for instance, he's looking at people's predictable biases. He has a very specific model of the human mind which allows us to exploit those kind of biases and irrationalities. He makes very strong claims often in interviews about reason playing no role in the formation of our beliefs, um, which I suppose is a useful view to have if you want to develop things like propaganda techniques or sales techniques. Um, I think, I mean, as a philosopher, I think that he doesn't have any evidence for that. We have to maintain our beliefs. We don't just um, absorb them and then fail to question them. We are involved constantly in justifying our own beliefs and reason clearly 
plays a very strong role in it. Um, but I think that this whole sector, the, the military and commercial sides of it, have absorbed a lot of behavioral science um, that views people through that lens of their people's plasticity and their manipulability. Um, and in terms of the boundaries between, for instance, electoral, political work and military work, well, the very same agencies as we see in the case of Cambridge Analytica are doing both. They're also doing all sorts of other um, commercial forms of work. And Cambridge Analytica is the one now super famous example on this who've, ha who've had some light shed on them. There are thousands of these boutique intelligence and military agencies now. The privatization has been going on for more than a decade. And they get government contracts and are encouraged to develop these military-grade strategies, which they can use across their client base with very, very little oversight. So for large corporations in higher education, in elections, there's just been very little oversight of it, partly because I think a huge amount of this was done during the global war on terror to develop counter-terrorism strategies without a lot of thought about bigger geopolitical questions. And now all of a sudden, the agencies are moving back to a concern about um, great power politics and competition with China and Russia and realizing you know, we've got now a lot of private companies that have taken over the powers that nation states would traditionally have. So Max Weber says that the state is the legitimacy, the monopoly on the use of legitimate force. And clearly this kind of soft power is a form of force in the world today. And nation states don't really have a monopoly on it anymore. Um, it's in the hands of a lot of private actors, both here and abroad. Um, and I think that's been a feature of the way in which this sector has developed during the war on terror that a lot of people are beginning to regret now. Yeah, Sorry, that was very broad. <laughs> I, I would also point to the fact that um, there's been a revolving door between government and this kind of, you know, sector for, you know, you know, including right back to World War II, actually. But um, what we saw during the war on terror was a massive, you know, increase in scale of this. Um, and the, you know, the... This is not the only company, as you rightly point out. However, you know, the um, the scale of this and, the, you know, I think we have never seen inside the propaganda machine in this way before, I think, uh, in this kind of scale. There was so much that they were involved in and there were so many people who uh, had insight into it, actually, and have come out and revealed things. Um, that, you know, this really, I hope, will be a wake-up moment for us, uh, like we've never seen before. But uh, we really, really need to act at this point. One thing I would also point to is the um, the tendency to view people as tools uh, by these, these actors, I think, is deeply important. One of the things that I saw in my research was the difference between people who work in government and people who work outside government in the private sector is, is actually quite huge. Um, but that's something that's exploited by governments because, you know, that it is a different culture and people, you know, are doing things in the same, you know, in the same teams um, that can be deployed in different um, areas which uh, government is a little bit more restricted on. You can, you can deploy a, uh, a PR company, open up a PR company in, an, in a country that uh, you're not at war with, for, for instance. You, there's no conflict, ongoing conflict with, uh, and it doesn't raise any suspicions. Whereas uh, if you're opening up, you know, if you're sending in troops, then that will be noticed. So there are different ways that you can uh, use uh, these kind of commercial entities, which make them, you know, very, very popular with government. It's growing and growing and growing and accelerating and very little oversight there's it's so hard to see inside what's going on and I think that's one of the, part of the appeal and we really need to um, you know act before we we end up with more of these kinds of companies emerging now I mean we're 
we're reading this week about um, Eric Prince's private company oh setting God, up yeah. a training academy in China, a military training academy, which has raised a lot of alarm in the intelligence community. Um, but of course, he, you know, Blackwater have the the power and the techniques and strategies that they do because that was funded by US government contracts. So I think there's been just a lot of carelessness about um, letting these, especially, well, I'm cyber weapons, but even um, conventional warfare techniques spread very easily. Um, that there hasn't been much resistance to that. And in fact, there's been, I think it's been encouraged that these private billionaires fund their own versions of the war on terror. And Peter Thiel is famous because he's very right wing and everyone disapproves of him for setting up Palantir, which is the sinister side of this. But I find it equally disturbing that all the so-called liberals in Silicon Valley have done the same thing. I mean, Mark, Mark Zuckerberg a few years ago um, had a Facebook message saying that he'd been reading Henry Kissinger's New World Order and decided that he wanted to really focus on solving geopolitical problems. Uh, I just thought, please don't. Please, <laughs> <laughs> please let accountable elected public yeah. officials do that instead. Um, I think it's less well known how much Eric Schmidt has done in that area. In, he went very forcefully into the counter-terrorism business um, when he set up Google Ideas, for instance. I know somebody on the list here was from Jigsaw, but I'm talking about his earlier initiatives with the um, State Department people that uh, set up Google Ideas, um, had a famous conference in Dublin in 2011 where they invited all sorts of former extremists along to talk about being an extremist and how you can get people not to be an extremist. And Google Ideas was set up to solve geopolitical problems, he said. Um, and now Eric Schmidt is, of course, on the Pentagon's um, Defense Innovation Advisory Board, along with behavioral scientists like Cass Sunstein. Larry Page used to be on it. There's just a very, very close relationship between Silicon Valley um, and military and intelligence and all of the private companies they're setting up that do that kind of thing, which just clearly needs a lot more regulation. Yeah, they're all buddies. Okay, so we're almost out of time. Um, I want to at least give the opportunity for one lucky person in the audience to be able to pose a question to the people on the panel today. Um, if, if you would like to ask a question, now would be the moment to raise your hand. Oh, I see a question. Hi, um, I'm Jesse Baldwin Philippi. Um, this is based off of Caroline's question um, and kind of what you're talking about. Seems like there are two things going on. One is this very interesting organizational story, kind of, of hiding a complicated mm -hmm. thing. Um, another one is the content and big data practices yeah. that are going on. Um, it seems like we've been latching on to the big data practices, but I think the organizational story is far more interesting here. Um, so my question is, is this a new problem, the organizational morass of this? Or is it an old problem, as you're kind of historicizing right now? Does the, the content, the tech, the data part allow us a new way to latch into an old problem? Because like it looks scary and different. Is it actually different? Does it change it in a way? Um, I'm curious about what your guys' take is on that. Can, can I respond to that first? Yeah. Um, I think this is a really good question. Thank you. Um, I, it's it's not a new problem, of course, but I think um, I, I I personally have never seen anything. There may I might be corrected by someone else who's got an example, but uh, on this scale, and I think that also it's it's important that they were working in Western elections. I think this is the only reason it came out. They got so arrogant that they were. You know, doing all this. there's lots of companies that work in unethical ways around the world, and nobody cares because it's Africa or somewhere you know else. Uh, it you know we care when it's our countries and our democracies, and then it's all over CNN and you know. And I think that's a really important point because you know um, 
I think they just got so too big for their boots. And there will be other companies, and may, maybe they'll be just as arrogant, but, but maybe they'll be a bit more careful. And we really need to look. We really need to look if we're going to find and watch for this. And and it's not also about looking. It's also about building in you know um, uh, protections in our systems. Um, do you want to? Um, I, there are two aspects of the problem that I think are new. So one is that we've always had big private companies that are defense contractors. But um, the venture capital model, which really emerged with Silicon Valley, is relatively new. And it has given a great deal more power to these private corporations because they receive government funding. They end up owning the patents. The government gets some non-exclusive rights to the use of their technologies, but the companies end up with the power and the resources and the money. Um, I think that's, that is a new aspect of the problem and a worrying one for, for various reasons. I think the no other new aspect is that in the era of cyber warfare, data has become so important and we've really not kept an eye on the ownership of data with the emergence of these um, new companies. I don't just mean the Silicon Valley Big Five. Hardly anyone knows who owns the apps that they use every day and who owns that data. People were recently shocked to find out that Grindr is Chinese owned and had been disclosing people's HIV status. I, I, I personally know of many apps that people would be very surprised to find out are Russian owned and that that's where their data is. That, that's just very, very little oversight of any of that. Um, data possession, and I think that's a new problem and a potentially worrying one. Can, can I just add one little extra thing on, because it fits perfectly with what you just said. Um, also, it's really pro troubling that uh, there is an effort to uh, monetize our data and, and put it in our possession, but um, get us to make money off it so that it incentivize us, uh, incentivizes us sharing it, especially the poorest of the poor. So you end up with these, um, we're, we're going to end up with like the people um, sharing their data with the most engaging and entertaining apps, even no, no matter who it's going to. Uh, so I think this kind of exploitation of uh, the commercialization of our data is something we really need to watch out for too. Um, so once again, thank you to Emma Bryant and Tamsin Shaw. Thank you for coming, everyone. Have a great night. Mm -hmm.